for those of you who saw Paul Hawkins' talk where he showed the big biomass bubble of beetles that was bigger than the biomass bubble of humans, you know what a big job <laughs> Scott has to do. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to read the titles of his more than 200 publications and research projects, and I'm just going to let him speak to you about monarch conservation. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. I am very excited to talk with you because to me, you're on the forefront of a movement to change the way we, uh, we do agriculture, to change the way we feed the world. And really, that's where we need to be, to be focused on uh, if, if we want a better place for our children in the future. Uh, I, I always start off my, my talks with my thank yous first because I hate to rush them at the end, and there are so many people that are, are part of allowing me to be up in front of an audience like this. I travel all over the United States, and indeed more all over uh, Europe and now Asia, giving these talks, and, and I couldn't do it without many, many people. So first of all, the conference organizers who put on a, a really great conference, uh, and, and some of the really inspirational uh, speakers who are working on the land, I want to thank them. If everybody could give a round of applause to them. I would really appreciate it. I do my talks because of my family. Uh, my family is, is, is the most important thing to me in the world, um, and they empower me to give these talks. Uh, I do it for their future, but they also really give back to me. They understand what I try to do and, 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 and really work with me. They may not all enter uh, uh, what I want to do. My daughter uh, there with the cello just got into medical school. I'm, I'm very, very excited. She's worked actually uh, on Native American community health for as an undergraduate, and her goal is to go back and, and work on that once she's done with medical school. So I'm extremely proud and have to tell everybody, everybody out there about her. Um, Xerces has over 8,000 members, uh, as well as uh, many, many uh, uh, foundations, federal government, state government, and corporate support. When I started Xerces, uh, I could have put this up here in 50 font, because we had so few funders, and, and now uh, it's, it's inspiring to me to see the level of support that we have. Xerces works to take the research that's out there and, and, and translate it for practitioners, because researchers always don't have the time to do that. And we couldn't do it without the many, many, many research partners we have. I won't name them all, don't have the time, but we have dozens and dozens. This is just a, just a smattering of that. And last, but certainly not least, my staff working across, the, uh, across North America on invertebrate conservation uh, projects, uh, they do the heavy lift as someone said before, they do the hard work, and I get up here and, and, uh, and, and get to just speak uh, and, and try to inspire audiences. So what is the Xerces Society? I was really happy that the, it was pronounced properly, because I've, I've often heard, so are you the Exerces Society? <laughs> what, what? What do you do? Um, we got that name by Robert Michael Pyle, who is a noted lepidopterist and naturalist, who um, back in 1971, one felt there needed to be an organization that, that, that focused on the bottom of the food chain. And he named Xerces after the first butterfly to go extinct in the United States, the Xerces Blue Butterfly. As San Francisco expanded, um, they, they built on the very last of that butterfly's habitat. And his goal was to have an organization to stop that from ever happening again. And we do that through a variety of, of, uh, uh, of, of ways. We work with public agencies and, and private landowners to try to understand the, the land and understand the habitat and management needs because you really can't conserve something you don't understand. We also empower citizens to be involved. We have 10, over 10,000 citizen scientists helping us to identify locations of rare bumblebees and helping us to understand monarch overwintering sites and migratory dragonflies and freshwater mussels. These are people that are empowering our work in a, in a really significant way. And I mainly just put this up here because I look good in a suit. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, I can dress up too, uh, but Xerces, unlike some other scientific organizations, we actually advocate. Somebody talked about how we need community organizing, but we also need to work on the policies and practices at both the state and federal level, and Xerces is there trying to, to make sure that these agencies do what they need to do for, for conservation. Um, to date, we have uh, reached more than 45,000 professionals through workshops uh, all over the world and it's really inspiring because to us it's it's the people on the ground the farmers the ranchers uh, that uh, that are doing the work uh, uh, that that will change this world and then last restoration and management is really what we're all about we've got restoration professionals in 10 states we've restored habitat for dozens of rare species and we've now hit the 200,000 200,000 acre mark uh, for new habitats for pollinators on farms. But today I'm going to talk to you about a pretty big topic. I've been hearing the, the on-the-ground work that, the, that people are doing, and it, it's really wonderful. I'm going to broaden our sphere a little bit to all of North America and talk about monarch butterfly conservation. Now, the, the monarch is one of the largest and most beautiful butterflies. I think many of us who grew up, I grew up in Nebraska, moved to Colorado, actually spent a lot of time in New Mexico, so I'm so happy happy to be back here. My dad and I used to come hiking here uh, uh, quite a lot. But I grew up with monarchs. They were in my yard. And I went back to Nebraska, and, and they just weren't there uh, with my family this last summer. And, uh, but it is one of the most recognizable species and can really act as a flagship for, for conservation. And, and it's really also the only true long-range migratory butterfly. We have some butterflies that will migrate up mountainsides and then back down into valleys uh, doing shorter migrations, but this butterfly really migrates. So for instance, this butterfly photographed here in Ontario, Canada, likely flew 2,000 miles to overwinter in, in fir forests north of, of Mexico. Likely joined up with many others in Texas or even New Mexico on the last leg of that migration, and then overwintered in these incredibly amazing overwintering areas in, in the first forest with many, many millions of, of, of monarchs. Now this is just a, a pictorial map of, of monarch migration. And uh, just to, to fully explain, we really have two populations of monarchs in the United States, an eastern monarch and a western monarch. Although there's lots of overlap and, and eastern monarchs uh, tend to go to Mexico, whereas western monarchs overwinter mostly at overwintering sites along the California coast. And the, I'll talk Mexico first. Uh, so in the spring, a monarch will, a monarch, millions of monarchs will leave the overwintering site, fly up to northern Mexico, southern Texas. They will find milkweed and lay their eggs. I'll talk about milkweed a little bit more later, but milkweed is the only plant that monarchs can use to lay their eggs, the only plant that caterpillars, their caterpillars can use. That generation that spent the winter in Mexico dies. The new generation develops develops in Texas, Oklahoma, uh, maybe even New Mexico, and I'll talk about that in, here in a little bit. Then that next generation radiates north uh, to the Midwest, where we have two to three more generations making their way all the way up into Canada, and then that last generation making it to Mexico. If you look in the West Coast, it's very similar except a shorter migration. We have a, over 100 overwintering sites in uh, uh, right along the coast from the Bay Area down to Baja. And uh, they radiate out through California in the first generation and then into, into the Great Basin, all the way up into Idaho, into western Colorado. Now, Arizona and New Mexico are really interesting because Arizona and New Mexico are likely the mixing pot for western and eastern monarchs. We know in Arizona that we have monarchs that go to Mexico 
and monarchs that go to California to overwinter. We know less about New, er, sorry, in Arizona we know that. We know less about New Mexico, but we suspect that this is an area where monarchs from the east and, and west, west mix, which makes this a special place and, and, and really important in the monarch migration uh, sort of issue. So I was asked the other day, are monarchs really in decline, as people say? You know, I talk about declining animals a lot, but this is one that's really easy to talk about um, uh, when it comes to decline. In the 1980s and 90s, we likely had almost a billion monarchs that went to Mexico. And in 2014, we only had 53 million. Now, 53 million sounds like a lot, but really we've seen a 82% decline over the 21-year average, which is huge for a common animal like this and really should cause us all a, a, bit, of, uh, a bit of thinking and a bit of concern. The Western monarch is also declining, and we have very good data. The Xerces Society has been working at overwintering sites since 1997, and, and we've seen a similar decline, although a little less, about a 50% decline. And as you can see, in 1997, we counted over 1.2 million monarchs at these overwintering sites, and in th this last year, we counted a little over 200,000. And you'll see that big bar in 1997, that's just the year we started monitoring, but we have, we have significant data from before that at sites where this population was actually likely much larger than, than a million point two two monarchs in, in the early 90s and, and 1980s. So we're seeing decline and, and, and that's epitomized by a new assessment that NatureServe did for the monarch where they found the eastern monarch migratory population to be critically imperiled and the western monarch population imperiled or vulnerable. So I think I can speak with the surety that the monarch has seen significant declines. And I want to point out that this is not an isolated I issue. Uh, it's not just monarchs. A few years ago I did a, a keynote in Reading, England on butterfly conservation in North America and so I went out to many of my colleagues to ask them a series of questions and the last one was uh, the take home message. What's the take home message for butterfly conservation in North America? And what startled me is 15 out of 18 of the people I talked to had a very similar quote to Dr. Jarrett Daniels from the University of Florida, where they said, yes, of course, these rare animals that had limited habitats, they're in decline. We've seen that for decades. But what he said is what should most be most alarming to all of us is that this downward trend is now spilled over to include many previously more wide-ranging and common butterflies. All of a sudden, we're starting to see the animals we took for granted declining. And this is uh, epitomized by another butterfly called the Regal Fritillary, which was widespread from the Pacific Ocean all the way over to Wyoming and, and Colorado. And if this is another nature serve uh, assessment, and if you look at the blues, uh, which are presumably extinct or extinct, the reds and, and oranges, which are critically imperiled or imperiled, and the yellow, which is vulnerable, um, you'll see that across its range, it seems to be winking out. Uh, interestingly, Kansas is the only state where it is apparently secure. And this was a very wide-ranging common butterfly in the upper Midwest. And then last, I'll just point out a study that was done in California over uh, since the 1970s. Uh, Dr. Art Shapiro has been monitoring the same sites across California. This is the longest single study of butterflies in North America. And what he has found at these sites is significant decline. We're actually losing species from these sites. Many of these sites have lost half of the butterflies that used to fly at these sites. And this is disturbing because these are natural areas. These are not sites where all of a sudden we're seeing condo development or large, you know, big ag. These are sites that are natural areas surrounded in a matrix of, of urbanization and agriculture.
Um, you've also all, I'm sure, heard about the issues with honeybees. In 2015, in some places, we've seen, we saw losses of over 40% for commercial honeybee keepers, which is very difficult to stay in business when you lose 40% of your animals on an annual basis. And then, and then last, it spills over to our, our native pollinator insects as well. We just did an assessment of, of, of bumblebees with IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, and found that over one quarter of all bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. So now let's just go drink tequila. And, um, you know, it's a little early in the day, but after hearing that, maybe we should. Um, but I'll get to the good part in a little bit. It's not going to all be doom and gloom. So what are the threats to monarchs? Well, the threats to monarchs are, of course, you all know this as well as I do, um, the biggest one is habitat loss. We tend to put our agriculture uh, and our houses in the areas where these animals used to live. And, uh, mil and milkweed is, is the only plant that, uh, that monarchs will use. And where you have these, you usually don't have much milkweed. We lose about f over 5,000 acres per day to real estate and energy development in the United States. And that is just picking up as the economy picks up. We've lost 9 million acres of grassland and prairie, which is converted to cropland since 2008. It's the largest conversion since the Dust Bowl. And it's really largely a result of federal biofuel policies um, that subsidize corn uh, ethanol production. So we're seeing incredible habitat loss out there. We're also seeing a different way of doing agriculture over the last decade and a half, two decades. Um, we've moved to even more intense large-scale monocultures, especially in the Midwest. And with the, with the uh, advent of, 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 of Roundup Ready, glyphosate herbicide, herbicide resistant corn and soy, we've seen the loss of a huge amount of habitat for monarch butterflies. It used to be that corn and soy had some milkweed adjacent and within in the crops. They no longer do, and we've seen a, 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 an incredible uptick in the use of these genetically modified, modified crops from 20 million acres in 1995 to 155 million acres uh, in 2013, and it continues to go up. And what studies show, I don't to, you, you use too many graphs, uh, but this is one that I thought was important, because study after study that looked at milkweed in the 19 1990s and then re-looked at milkweed in 2009, 2010, 2011 has found that these farmers are getting very, very good at controlling weeds in and right next to their fields. And we've seen a 96% loss on average of milkweed throughout Iowa, and that's mirrored in, in many, many other, other states. And, and, and monarchs need milkweed to, to survive. Pesticides are also a factor in, in decline of, of, of monarchs. Um, uh, of, I talked about glyphosate, of course, taking out the, the, the milkweed, but insecticides are also an important issue. Um, every year we see large thousands of monarchs, sometimes tens of thousands of monarchs, killed due to mosquito control in Mexico. And what's so disheartening about this is this is what's getting the news. And, and I appreciate that people care about monarchs. But on the same pictures, you see the federal government spraying insecticides right over their kids. And, and I have to say, I, I'm an insect, I, I like insects, and I work for their conservation, but that's what pulls at my heartstrings. We need, to, we need to change the way we use pesticides, not just because of the monarch or the bee, but because of the human being. So, um, so but, but mos mosquito management is, is, a, is a huge issue. You may have heard about uh, neonicotinoids. Uh, this is a, a big issue for our bees in this country. 
and likely an issue for monarchs as well. So neonicotinoids are a n fairly new class of insecticide, and um, I uh, term them in, in science parlance as, as highly toxic, highly persistent, systemic insecticides. So highly toxic, that makes sense. Insecticide, they're supposed to kill insects. But these are new and novel in that they're s they have a systemic mode of action. When they're put into the soil, when they're sprayed on a plant, they're absorbed into the plant. And then every part of that plant ends up having that chemical in it, including pollen and including the nectar. But probably what's most problematic about these chemicals is their persistence. One study found that after six years in crab apple, you could still find this neonicotinoid after one treatment, six years. In soil, they've been shown to go from one crop to the other without reapplication. You, you put in the stubble, you grow new crop, and, and neonicotinoids will be in that crop. They're also affecting many, many, many of our other beneficial insects. They're found uh, everywhere now in the environment, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, and affecting uh, water quality and our aquatic insects, as well as many of our predators and, and parasitoids. And a new study, a new, couple new studies have shown that they may be likely contributors to monarch decline as well. They found that clothanidin, which is just one of six Six of these products that are used um, is a likely contributor. And you can imagine um, monarchs, caterpillars need to eat milkweed. And if that milkweed has this toxin in it, it's likely that those caterpillars are not going to survive. And the issue is it's persistent and it's now everywhere. This is a from the USGS uh, that shows the use of clothanidin, which is, as I said, just one of these six products. And you can see that in the middle of the country where monarchs are, are, are breeding to go back to Mexico, we use an awful lot of, of, of these chemicals, and, and it's likely, likely a major issue. Of course, I did want to touch a little bit on uh, logging at overwintering sites in Mexico. Long been an issue for monarchs, and you can see that um, the blue outline is, is the biosphere reserve, the red uh, are, is the core area where we find the monarchs, and you can see that there are lots of now openings in, in the forest. I do want to say that the Mexican government has worked very hard, and this situation has improved. Um, it's improved markedly. It's still an issue, but, uh, but the Mexican uh, uh, government government has worked to, one, try to get rid of the industrial logging and then try to help the local citizens to manage in a sustainable way logging uh, on, a, on a smaller scale for, for the locals. Um, What's interesting is, is subsistence logging in Mexico is often an issue that the, they don't have uh, enough money. Um, we lose sites in California because there's too much money. Um, these uh, monarch sites uh, up and down the California coast are prime real estate. They almost all overlook the Pacific Ocean between San Francisco and, uh, and LA. And you can imagine how expensive that real estate is, and, and we're, seeing, we're seeing loss of sites there as well. And then last, but not, certainly not least, is climate and weather. Uh, our climate is changing. And uh, a colleague of mine coined what I thought was a better term. We talked climate change, we talked global warming, but he said climate destabilization is what he likes to call uh, uh, this phenomenon because what's happening is we'll have an incredibly wet year, then we'll have drought, then we'll have big storms, then we'll have an incredibly wet year, and then we'll have drought. We're seeing these ups and downs. It makes it very difficult for animals to, uh, to subsist in these environments that, that are really now topsy-turvy. So that's the depressing part of my talk. 
um, now for the uh, I think we can make the change we need part of my talk. And I'm seeing it happen across the country. If we want to make this change, we need to do this in all environments. Farmland, natural sites, urban and suburban areas all need to be part of this solution. And I think people are coming to the table in a pretty big way. And specifically for monarchs, we want to make sure that we protect and manage natal, natal habitat that remains. Um, that means milkweed and promote large-scale habitat projects with milkweed. But it doesn't only mean milkweed because monarchs need nectar sources as well. What we need is diverse native plant plantings um, and I'll talk a little bit about how and, and managing the systems we have. So, so we need milkweed, they need nectar sources, and we need to reduce stressors such as pesticides. I've spent a fair bit of time at the White House recently and, and everybody's excited about this monarch issue, but they almost have a Johnny wildflower seed approach to monarch or bee conservation. We're just gonna put wildflowers out there on the landscape and we're not gonna think about where and how we do it. We're not gonna think about what's over the fence and whether these will get sprayed out uh, by or impacted by insecticides or herbicides. And we need, a, we need to do this in a big way, but we also need to be thoughtful about how we're doing this restoration. And what's really neat about monarch uh, conservation or pollinator conservation in general is that in many areas, we don't need to plant a single plant. We just need to think about how we're managing our landscapes, which is what you folks already do. And um, there are so many opportunities between prescribed grazing, burning, um, managing our roadsides differently, dealing with invasive species that can help all of these animals. Now the natural areas need to be the glue that hold all this together. And we need to be thoughtful about how we are managing our natural areas. But, but and, and what case studies show, and, and I include ranches in, in the idea of natural area. To me, where I grew up in western Nebraska and living in Colorado and traveling the west, many of our ranches are the places where nature still exists in a managed landscape. And studies really do show that stocking rate, duration, and timing of grazing can, um, can improve habitat for monarchs. So monarchs and grazing are really compatible. Now, m milkweed is, is, and I may get this question, so I'm gonna preempt it, milkweed's toxic. Um, and it's toxic if, if cattle eat it. But the studies we, we've seen and the ranchers we've talked to when you're managing stocking rates, we've never seen this as an issue. And we haven't had a rancher that has really seen this as an issue unless stocking rates are just just beyond the pale because um, along with being toxic, it's highly unpalatable. It doesn't taste good. The cows don't want to eat it. It is an issue that we'll need to deal with in hay. We need to not have milkweed in, in hay, but in a normal grazing landscape, milkweed and cattle seem to be very compatible. So after this uh, talk, any of you that have information on that, we would love to gather that information because we're putting together case studies on where it works and, and, if, it, and if it doesn't. Um, roadsides are also a really important place and I'm sure on all of your uh, ranch lands, farm lands, you've got roadsides and roadsides can be a really important place for pollinators and provide everything a pollinator including uh, a monarch needs. And uh, what's really interesting is that there's good data. A lot of people ask, well, do you want habitat along roadsides, especially highways? Won't the animals get, get hit? Well, when it comes to pollinators such as bees and butterflies, what the data clearly suggests is that if you have a diversity of native plants, Actually, the butterflies and bees move less. They have everything they need closer to home. Um, I know there's a joke here about why the butterfly didn't cross the road, but I haven't figured that one out yet, so, so I'm not gonna use that. But, but, and, and I think that, that roadsides then can be an important part of, of the picture. And what's really exciting is that right now there's a national framework that we can, uh, many of us can tap into for monarch and pollinator conservation. 
I'm going to drink of water here. Um, in May 2015, the White House released a national strategy to protect pollinators and their habitat. Now, I'm going to go back 20 years when I started working on, 25 years when I started working on butterflies and, and started thinking about pollinators. Um, there's a gentleman who probably many of you may know personally, and most of you I'm sure have heard of, uh, Gary Nabhan, who, uh, along with Steve Buchman, wrote the book Forgotten Pollinators. But back in the 90s, we could have fit the uh, everybody interested in pollinator conservation uh, around a, a, a a kitchen table, if not a, a big, uh, maybe outside table. There weren't that many of us talking about it. And to have the president actually tell all federal agencies that they have to take action for pollinators, to me, is, is a really major thing after, after pushing on this issue now for two decades. And that's what this document does. This document uh, assigns all federal agencies with taking action to protect both bees as well as monarch butterflies and with the goal of seven million acres of pollinator habitat within the next five years. So um, it's, a, it's a big and lofty goal, but, uh, and there's a lot of work to do, but it's pretty amazing that, 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 we're, that we're here right now. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has also uh, stepped up and, and, and now has the High Level Monarch Working Group, which is dedicated to monarch conservation uh, across the United States. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration is actually working with us to develop best management practices for highways that we can use uh, for state dots all across the country for both pollinator conservation generally and monarch conservation specifically. The Forest Service has come out with best management practices as well, and many of the other agencies are too. Um, I think for this audience, the, the farm bill is, is important to speak to, uh, if at least briefly. As I'm sure you all know, uh, the farm bill has about $4 billion in annual funding for conservation. The farm bill is this huge, giant thing, but the conservation programs are, I believe, um, really good and, and really beneficial. And the Xerces Society, working with legislators uh, as well as many partners across the United States, were able to incorporate pollinators as a priority resource concern in both the 2008 and 2014 farm bills. And what this simply does is uh, allows farmers uh, or ranchers to tap into cost share funding for habitat improvements or, or management, um, lowering their costs, uh, you know, similar to what you would do for erosion or, uh, or other wildlife habitat. You can now use pollinators to, uh, as a reason, as a way to get, get and manage new habitat. And uh, most of this is through a, a variety of programs, but if you're interested, you can go to our website and just click in, it's xerces.org, and just uh, search for Farm Bill programs, and we've got a whole document that we prepared with USDA on uh, the programs that, that you can tap into for, for pollinator conservation, including EQIP, CSP, uh, as well as uh, through the Farm Service Agency, the uh, C RP. And um, also, along with this really very cool, yesterday, the NRCS uh, launched a new Monarch Initiative. And this Monarch Initiative uh, is going to provide $4 million for, uh, for new programs specifically targeted at monarch butterflies through EQIP uh, and ASEP, which is formerly WRP, and, and the CSP program. And um, uh, unfortunately, this, this does, I'll talk about New Mexico in a minute. This, this specific uh, uh, initiative doesn't affect New Mex Mexico. It affects 10 states. 
in in uh, uh, in the northern tier, and then uh, Texas, Oklahoma, and uh, Kansas. But you can tap into funding both for uh, through Equip, both for a more farm-based riparian herbaceous or conservation cover, as well as focused on grazing land, uh, getting credits for prescribed grazing and, and brush management. So we at Xerces working with NRCS see that ranchers uh, and uh, people who, who graze cattle can be an important part of this process. In, uh, as for WRP, there's an extra two million, and this is for ongoing restoration of land currently enrolled in WRP to make it more uh, to, uh, better for, for, for monarchs. And then CSP, there's already money in the program, so there's no new money, but, uh, but you can, you can the focus is going to be on a grazing management uh, to improve uh, monarch butterfly habitat in, in the southern Great Plains, Texas, Oklahoma, and, and Kansas. Um, but if you're outside of that area, you can also tap into farm bill programs using the general pollinator uh, uh, provisions of, of the farm bill. So we have farmers all across the United States who are putting in pollinator habitat and including milkweed and, and doing this through EQIP or CSP or CRP or these other, other programs. And specifically with CRP, which is managed by the Feder uh, Farm Services Agency, and uh, but but the technical assistance comes from N NRCS. We, they're not quite there to roll out their new Monarch initiative, but we're looking at doing state acres for wildlife program, and uh, and and looking at at how that might work, uh, and looking at mid contract management for 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 Monarchs as well. We've got a few tools that I'll just run by very quickly because uh, I'm, I'm going to run out of time. We've got plant lists on our site that you can uh, find out what's best for monarchs. We're working on uh, IPM for corn and soy to see if we can lessen the impact on monarchs in corn and soybeans throughout the Midwest. And uh, for, for ranchers, we're developing natural uh, assessment tools for natural lands as well as management guidance specifically for monarchs. We've got a variety of resources and most of them are, are at our website at, at xerces.org. And uh, we've got our book, uh, which is a kind of one-stop shop for pollinator conservation. Uh, Gary Nabhan kindly wrote a recommendation for, for this book. And I really do think that uh, with all of us, ranchers, farmers, people who grow food, people who eat food, <laughs> we can get there. And I have to be an optimist. Maybe it's my kids coming back to me, but I think that I'm seeing big things happen. We just need to direct them in the right way. And this is a wonderful audience who's already doing great things, who may be able to take this information and even do more. So thank you for what you do and thank you for your time. Scott Black, everyone.